Well, good morning and welcome everybody to Fairview Baptist Church and our worship services. I know that God will bless as we worship in the name of Jesus Christ this morning. So I just pray that he will touch you in a great and mighty way. And Rodney, if you would, then let's begin. power God we 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 praise you uh, we hope that what we do here today will will be pleasing to you God father we uh, pray for the needs of our church we pray for the needs of the members of our community and we pray for we pray for our health Lord and we just ask that you would just continue to, to guide us and to bless us Lord father we just uh, you know pray now for our leaders as well as they continue to lead us through these through these tri trying times and Lord, most of all, we hope that, that our leadership, and as, as well as we, are looking to you for guidance, Lord. We pray all these things in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would, turn and wave to those and greet them as they come in here. We're glad to have Virginia with us. You can't see her, but we can see her smiling face. So we're, we're glad to have her. And I, her family's just slightly excited that she's there with us today. But, but I'm glad to have you, Virginia. Uh, the way of announcements, uh, when my mom says hello, and we'll say hello to my mom as, as well. Uh, today she is doing well. I thank you for the time to be able to get by and to, and to see and visit with her. We got Henry's nails clipped, got her flu shot, and so she, we're, she's all set up and things. But uh, thank you for that time to get there. Uh, this Wednesday, uh, for our deacons, if you'd like to have our deacon meeting this Wednesday at 7 here at the church as we meet and continue to pray. Uh, for our church and for our world. Uh, also, uh, you may have seen the email that went out, but the WMU uh, so is uh, challenge us. We got World Hunger Day coming up, and uh, the challenge is that each of our association of churches collect 50 cans. Now we're looking just just for cans for the for the Broadhead Food Pantry. So if you can begin looking through your closets or as you go to Walmart to pick up a few extra ones, you can bring them here, of course, to church with you. You can set them outside my door uh, during the week or things. I'm generally there or I'll find them that way. But uh, we want you to have them in by October the 10th, uh, if you would. So just uh, begin collecting cans for the uh, canned goods, not cans, canned goods for the Broadhead uh, Food Pantry. And also, uh, I was on a Zoom call meeting uh, with uh, Jason uh, Hasty from the Lord's Cafe, and they are now in the situation where they're uh, using what they're calling family groups to come down, especially to help with the construction. So if you would be interested, they're, they're talking about groups, you know, six or so or things. It doesn't have to be a family, but you would then go down, you would stay together, you would work on a project together, and then come home. But they've got painting and drywalling and and different kinds of construction things. But uh, if you're interested in that, uh, let me know. You can go, uh, the, a lot of them are going down just for the weekend, coming down on Friday and things and stuff that way. Uh, but they are open uh, for that kind of ministry. So just let me know uh, if you are interested uh, in that as well. Also, I wanna let you know, as you well know, that Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief is out. And of course, Southern Baptist Relief has been going through all of the things uh, that, that have been with us. Uh, I got a little email the other day. They uh, were, uh, they've been, they've sent chainsaw teams to Baldwin 
County, which is southeast of Mobile, Alabama. Uh, they have brought their trailers with heavy equipment and things, and they brought a skid steer. I know you guys know what that means, but, uh, but I'd have no idea, oh, and a cherry picker along with them. Uh, but as far as how they've been handling the relief during especially Hurricane Laura, they have prepared 270,000 meals. They've presented the gospel over 1,000 times. They've had 254 professions of faith. Uh, they have had five, oh, over 6,000, almost 7,000 showers uh, and have done, ladies, 3,556 loads of laundry. Okay, now, I know that some of you did that last week <laughs> with your teenagers, but, uh, the, but they have done uh, that many. So continue to pray for them. Uh, if you would like to give to the disaster relief, you know, please go ahead and do that. You can do that through the church. Just mark uh, your, uh, your offering that you want that to go to disaster relief, and we'll, it'll go straight there. But know, as you always do, uh, that the Southern Baptist churches are at every disaster around the world and as you give your offering that enables them to be able to do that uh, be proud of that uh, pray for them uh, as we minister uh, around the world all right Rodney, if you will then please let's continue All right, we're going to sing Standing on the Promises 335. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. <clears throat> to 320 we're going to sing turn your eyes upon Jesus we're going to sing all three verses
this time, we'd like to thank God for the blessings that he has given us. So if you'll offer up those thanksgiving and silent prayer as Lisa plays. God, we just thank you for all that you have done for us, how you have just showered your love and your mercy and your forgiveness upon us. You have taken care of us uh, with our every need. You sustain us in all areas of our lives, and we know that we are standing upon your sure and strong foundation. Thank you for all that you do and continue to do, and we'll give you the glory and honor and praise in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would then enjoy our special music. <clears throat>
Turn with me uh, this morning, uh, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And as you are turning to that, I want to remind you that we are continuing to pray for who's your one. And I want to remind you that this is the last Sunday in September. So you have October, November, and December to be able to uh, find that time to be able to speak to that one that's on your heart. I want you to know that this past week I found that time that God gave me the opportunity in this situation and I was able to sit down with the one that was on my heart. They were very open and receptive. I shared with them uh, from John 3.16 as as we have done. Uh, But uh, the seed, I'll just say this, the seed was planted. Uh, They said they were not ready to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior at the time but appreciated that I took the opportunity to speak to them and cared about them and prayed for them. And the Holy Spirit will take it uh, from there. So that's, that's what we're looking for and that's what we want to do. And as I said, the challenge was is to pray for that one person. And by the end of the year, to be able to then go and speak to them about the love of Jesus Christ. So like I said, you've got three months as that goes. Uh, now, you know what I need have to do now? I now need to start praying for my next one, all right? So that way, of course, I'll continue to pray for this one. But like I said, then I just now add another person as as we go along. But you continue to do that, and I know the Lord will bless. We have turned, if you have, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, We're going to begin in verse 7. If you would please stand with me as we read from God's word this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and beginning in verse 7. But we have this treasure of earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are cast down, but not destroyed. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the reading of your word, for its strength and for its power and for how Lord, that we can stand upon it and know that you are with us. I pray this morning, Father, that you will fill us with your spirit. I pray that you will move in such a strong and mighty way. I pray that our lives will be changed as we are come here together. If there's one here that does not know you, Father, I pray they surrender their lives to you this day. Receive the forgiveness of their sins and the hope of eternal life. But Lord, move in our lives as we open up ourselves to you and allow you to take us, to use us, and to mold us into thy glory. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, how is it that we are able to overcome things in our lives? Is it that we are, that we are trained for them, that we are prepared for them? Is it that we have superior intelligence as we look for them? What is it that we need to have to be able to overcome the situations that are in our lives? And today I want to look at that because it's the, the ability that we should have as Christians to look at a situation and then by faith rise above the circumstances no matter how or what that has and leave the the solution in God's hands. There was a story about an old mule that uh, the farmer had and they had an empty well that they had forgot to fill up and the old mule happened by it one day and fell in and it was a pretty deep well and so the farmer called his sons and everybody and they tried to figure out a way to get the mule out and things with ropes and stuff and things and no matter what they did they were not able to get that poor mule out. They worked all day. They called the neighbors. They had all kinds of ideas and things about what they could be able to do to be able to get this poor mule out. But nothing they did worked. And so finally, towards the end of the day, the farmer said, well, boys, he says, we've tried everything we can. I said, the only thing we can do is put the old mule out of her misery. So just fill in the hole. And so the fellows with sadness in their hearts and things, they got their shovels and they started throwing dirt down in the hole. Well, next thing you know, what they didn't see was the mule was down there and the mule was shaking the dirt off of of the head and then stomping down and shaking dirt off and stomping down. 
And I hope you've caught up with me by now because right before then, at the end of that, the old mule walked out because it had just stepped on the dirt and it filled out and walked out that way. As Christians, there will be times and situations in our lives that we may feel that we're like that old mule. That we will be in so much trouble that it will seem as though we have fell in a well and there was nowhere out. Everything that we try seems to hit a brick wall. Forward, backwards, sideways, that no matter what we try to do, that nothing seems to work. You turn to your friends and they give you some good advice and things, but it just doesn't fit your situations. They have good intentions and love, but the problem is still there. And finally, everybody has given up on you. And your friends, instead of helping, then begin to shovel dirt on top of you. What happens when you get in that situation? Because you still do not give up. You have faith that God will see you through. You stand on the promise that he who endures to the end shall be saved. You know that the Bible says that God will never leave you or forsake you. And even as you are being buried alive by the problems that are around you, you do not lose your trust in God. And so what happens? When it gets to the very end, you walk out of the well alive because you have kept your faith in God. Now, does that seem impossible to you? Does the situation that you are going through right now say, well, yeah, bro, Brother Razor, you don't know what I'm going through. This pandemic and things and stuff and everything that is going on. You're right. That dirt is getting shoveled on my head, but I'm not getting any higher. How could that possibly, possibly work? Well, you know, the Bible is filled from one end to the other of real people who have faced real situations. And because they have not lost their faith in God, they have come through those situations. Moses led Israel out of Egypt with a stick. Now we all know what was that stick, and that's why I said that's the faith. David took care of Goliath with a rock. The giant that was challenging the forces of Israel that everybody else was afraid of and made no one knew what to do, he used a rock. Joseph overcome his murderous brothers who sold him into slavery to become second in command to Pharaoh and had control over all of 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 all of his things. It has happened and will continue. And the secret is that they did not lose their faith in God. Look at verse 7. It says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Paul tells us that our treasure is in earthen vessels. God has poured himself into our lives. We are those earthen vessels. We are imperfect. We do not have the answer to our situation within our power or within our realm. That's why it doesn't really matter how smart you are or how much money you have or how talented you are or even how pretty you are. That the record show there was just a little bit of laughter. We cannot overcome our problems by ourselves. We are those earthen vessels. And listen to what the Bible says. It says that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You see, that's how it's set up. God knows you cannot overcome the problem in your life. He knows that you do not have the power or the ability that you have. And he is so concerned about that that he has come up with a solution. And that solution is to pour himself into you. When I have a computer problem, poor Ben, bless his heart, (laughs) 
<laughs> I call up Ben and allow him, if you will, to pour his knowledge about computers and things. And we all know, John Boy, what the first question he asks, do you have it plugged in and turned on? <laughs> and we're not going to go into how many times that happens because this is my sermon, not his. But... I use his expertise, I use his intelligence, I use his experience on how to fix my problem because I know I don't know. I thought I'd hear a few amens, but that's okay. And that's what God is saying. Do you understand what that means? He says, I know you cannot handle the problem in your life, and so I am going to fix it by pouring myself, the God of all creation of the universe, into your life. Isn't that what he says? He says that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I do not worry about fixing my computer when I pick up that phone and call Ben. And we should have that same kind, of, we should have more than that same kind of faith when we are facing the problems in our lives. You see, God knows that we can't do these things on our own. He wants us to focus on him and to allow his power to work. He wants us to get out of the way and let him do it. Why did David defeat Goliath with just a rock? Why did not God just say, Goliath, you have railed against the God of the universe. I'll show you. Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he say, Goliath, you have called my people all kinds of names. Watch this. Israel, go. And Goliath was defeated. Instead, what did he do? He used a little shepherd's boy who could not even put on a soldier's armor to pick up five rocks out of a creek bed and use a sling and walk out by himself and have Goliath go, you send me a dog out here to defeat me? And David says, not by mine, but in the name of the God that I serve, and he stood that sling, and one rock took Goliath down. Is there any question about how that happened? The excellency of God working through a faithful servant in the nation of Israel was saved. That's what we are talking about here. You see, if we get our eyes off of God, Satan wants to take even the smallest problem that we have and use, us, use it to defeat us. If he can get our minds off of God and to focus on our limitations and on what we can do, he will overwhelm you with the situation and with the difficulty that is there. He will give you loneliness and despair. And he is, all he is searching for is to get your eyes off of God. And once that happens, he's got you. And it's not easy. Look at verse 8. I mean, God doesn't say, you know, this is going to be easy. Look at verse 8. He says, we are troubled on every side. God understands how hard your problem is. He doesn't even just say, well, you got a problem in front of you. He goes, no, you got a problem on this side, on this side, on that side, on that side, behind you, before you. You are troubled on every side. He says that, but sometimes the answer is simple and sometimes the answer is long in coming. But look at the promise, yet not distressed. The problem is there, the problem is real, but you are not without hope. He goes on to say, we are perplexed. I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many of you have been in a problem where you have absolutely no idea, even in your own weakness? I mean, I've come to Lisa and I've said, hey, I know how to solve this. <laughs> you know, and I was wrong, and we won't go into that either because it's my sermon. I'll go back over here. Did you have no idea how you're going to fix it? I can see even from your eyes 
that I think everybody in here has been in that situation. When you have a problem where you have absolutely no idea, even the camera is shaking its head <laughs> that way, on how to solve that problem. You are perplexed. See what I mean? God knows what's going on in your life. He is not oblivious to it. He knows how real the problems you are that you're going through in life. And he says, you know what? You may be troubled, but I want you to know you are not in distress. You may be in perplexed about it and not have a clue about which way to turn. But look at the promise. You are not in despair. God will answer your problem. As Lisa and I went through, uh, through our lives, there's many times that have this happened. I was without a job, and so I took a job that I didn't even like to be able to do things because we didn't know where to go, where money was coming in, and different things that way. I think maybe you all know that Lisa babysat 10 kids at one time. So because we, just, we had to have the income, we didn't know which way to turn. I went, we went to seminary with four children and lived in literally a three-room apartment. Lisa and I were in one room, four kids in the other room, <laughs> and we had a living room, kitchen, sauna, hot no, <laughs> living room and kitchen, and went through four years of seminary like that. We were perplexed, but we knew where God was leading and look where we are now. We were distraught. We were troubled. We were perplexed. But we were not in despair. And God knows so much about our problems that he does not stop there. Notice what he says in verse 9. He also says that we are persecuted. Once again, these are not good words. But I want you to understand who is saying them and why he is saying them. Because he knows your life. He knows your footsteps. He knows what you are going through. Pandemic, unemployment, situations in your relationships, in your jobs, wherever you are. He knows this world. He knows that it is turning against us. So much so that he uses the word persecuted. I don't think I need to go into the Greek definition of that word. It's as bad and worse as you think it is when you think about being persecuted. And I don't want to say that to scare you about it. I want you to say that. I want to say that because I want you to know that the God who loves you, who cares for you, who gave his son Jesus Christ for you, knows that's what you're going through. And he has an answer and a solution to that. Think about what happened to Paul. Paul was, Paul was thrown out of places. He was stoned. He was left for dead. He was shipwrecked. He was attacked. He was jailed. And did he ever stop and did God ever forget about him? No. He continued on in all things. Jesus has said that we, he knows that the world will hate us because it hated him. And I don't think it takes many of us too long to look around and realize that's where the world is right now. But he also promised, he said, to be with us. Verse 9, he says, you are persecuted, but you are not forsaken. God promises to always be there, to always be with you, to always help you, to always support you, that you will never be forsaken in anything that you do or anywhere that you are. Think about that. He says that you will be cast down but you will not be destroyed. God understands that this world is not easy. God understands that the situations that you are going through are hard. God knows that you cry yourself to sleep. God knows that you don't have, at times, a, an idea of where you are going or what is going on. And like I said, I don't want you to... I don't want to overwhelm you with that, but I want you to hold on to the promises of that. 
He says that we have this treasure, verse 7, in earthen vessels. We, that's the reality. That we are limited by our scope, by our vision, by our resources, by our power. That he knows that you know, earthen vessels will crumble and fall. And they are not strong. But the reason is, he says, so the excellency of the power of God may be, may be of God and not of us. That when we overcome our problems, Lisa and I did not get out of seminary. There's a whole lot of stories, and I've shared stories with you again, and probably some that I haven't, and so there's just so many of them. We did not get out of seminary with four children on our own power. <laughs> Close maybe to Lisa, definitely not mine, but it was, it was the power of God that enabled us to get through that part of our lives that allows us to be here with you today. God did that. Listen to those words again. You are not distressed. You are not in despair. You are not forsaken. And you are not destroyed because God's hand is with you. The Holy Spirit is there. Job lost everything, but he was not destroyed. Satan thought Jesus was defeated when he hung on that cross and when he was put into that tomb and when the stole, the stole the stone was rolled into place and the whole world was cast into darkness and Satan thought, all right. But we know that wasn't the end of the story. The disciples ran into the upper room and hid and were scared. Because in their, home, in their humanness, there was no way out. And yet, on that glorious resurrection day, the stone was rolled away. And Jesus is alive and sits now at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and I and for the sins of the world. That we may have life because he has poured his excellency into us if we will but turn to him. Being a Christian does not mean that we will never suffer. Suffer. Being a Christian means that this world can give us everything it has, but in the end, we know that we will win. It may not be easy. It may be long. We may be per perplexed, but we, we may be cast down, but we will not be destroyed. We can go through and get through this worldwide pandemic. We can go through and get through the situations that are in our lives. Not by our own strength, but by the power of God working within us. I ask you this morning, what do you want today? Do you want to continue dealing with the problems that you have with your own power and with your own strength? If I told you that I had a computer problem after today, if you didn't know it before... And the first thing you said, well, did you call Ben? And I said, nope. <laughs> I'm handling this on my own. You would shake your head, roll your eyes, and walk away. <laughs> What's wrong with him? He's got a son. He put him through college. He knows what's going on, and he doesn't want to turn to him and ask him. You may be saying the same thing to yourself today. You may be saying, well, that's nice, preacher, but I can handle all these things on my own. That's nice, preacher, but I can take care of myself. That's nice, preacher, but the problems before me, I'll take care of them. And you know deep down in your heart, you can't. I want you to know today that God is waiting and willing to take your life and to change it if you will but turn to him. Will you do that today right where you are? And if we're here at the church, these front pews are open, you can come and surrender to God and give him your life today and he will take you. And Christian, let's live our lives. As I said, this is reality and God understands that you are dealing with reality. God understands the problems that you are going through and he gives us a solution through his son Jesus Christ. And will you live that way? Will you cry out to him? And will you especially share with the world about the Savior? that can save their lives. You come this morning if you need to pray with me 
uh, stay here on the front pew, and after the service is over, we'll go and pray. Uh, but if you want to come up and pray and go back to your seat, that's fine. You at home, please pray wherever you are and give your life to Jesus today and allow him to take you and use you for his glory. You do that as Lisa prays. Dear God, we give you our lives this day and ask you to take them and use them as only you can. I thank you of knowing that we are not forsaken. I thank you of knowing that we are not cast down. I thank you of knowing that in each and every situation that we face, that you have given us a way out, that you may receive the glory, Father. I pray for those who accepted you today that you will fill them with your love and your forgiveness and your joy. Uh, Father, you have changed their lives as they have placed them in your hands. And I pray as we leave this place that we will do everything that we can, both our words and our deeds, to share the love of Jesus Christ, that the world may know you and your forgiveness and your love, your mercy, and your power as you have indeed given yourself for us. Thank you. Thank you. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen.